Hey Summoners, it's Dan, and welcome to another Pro Guides video. Some of you guys have asked for this video, and as always, we're here to deliver. In this video, we're going to cover mistakes you have to avoid in order to improve and climb. Also, here's a question we want to ask you guys. Who's your favorite pro player and why? Let us know in the comments down below. We want to hear it. Make sure to also let us know what video you guys want to see next. But before we get started, we want to make sure that you guys go to ProGuides.com if you want to see huge improvements in your rank. We upload video guides similar to this one on our website every single day. As of now, we're currently uploading a challenger gameplay analysis guide for every single champion, so make sure to click that link below. Also, we have an exclusive coaching feature called InstaPro, which provides instant, on-demand, 24-7 coaching from the best of the best. Trust me guys, you don't want to miss out on this, so sign up today! Alright, with that all being said, let's jump right into it. The first mistake you need to avoid is trying to trade when your opponent is building a large minion wave. There is an exception. If you're trying to thin the wave or trying to block a dive, it may be necessary for you to contest the push. In many cases, however, trading versus a stacked wave is a high-risk, low-reward play. Here's why. You might win a trade if you're stronger, but you're more likely to lose it because of your minion wave disadvantage. If you get ganked or killed as a result of the trade you take, you lose a lot more than you normally would. Since your opponent stacked up a wave, that's a lot of minions you haven't farmed yet. Contrarily, your enemy has already picked up that farm, and that's why the wave is pushing into you. If you allow them to finish pushing, the wave will crash into your turret, and then you can equalize the EXP and or gold. When you randomly die though, your lane phase is probably doomed. The other reason why you don't want to play aggressively against a big minion wave is that if you get chunked too hard, you open yourself up to a dive. Lower elo players may find that this goes unpunished, but great junglers and smurfs you come across will immediately read the situation. You'll get dove and lose the giant wave the same way you'd lose it through a gank. This is one of the most common mistakes lower elo players make, and one that higher elo players get punished extremely hard for. Our second piece of advice is not to gank lost lanes. This is different from a losing one. A losing lane is one where the matchup is difficult and they're at a disadvantage. A lost lane is one where the enemy is significantly stronger because of a huge lead they've built. If your bot laner is playing Ezreal vs Lucian and the scoreboard is even, it's definitely fair game for you to gank. When that Lucian is 4-0, however, you might just waste your time and create an even bigger problem. You always need to assess whether or not it's possible to gank an enemy and also how likely that gank is to succeed. Shutdowns are an often forgotten mechanic that can allow you to bounce back into the game. Taking advantage of them, however, requires you to have strong judgment skills. Don't make the mistake of tunneling and trying to shut down a snowballing enemy when you can't. Try to create leads for yourself or on the other side of the map to fight them later. Our next mistake to avoid is about roaming. Don't follow roams when you can't and also don't roam when it's not the high percentage play. A lot of the time, your teammates are going to spam ping you and possibly even take it to the game chat if you don't follow roams. We're definitely not saying you should never follow them either, but you need to isolate yourself from the incessant noise and be able to determine what the right call is. When you're weaker than your opponent or need to catch a huge wave, following a roam is as impactful as inting is. If you follow a roam when you're weaker, your opponent could be waiting for you in the river and all in you once they catch you there. Anytime you follow a roam, there's no guarantee that the play will work out well and you might end up missing your wave. There will be times where you should still follow a roam in spite of this, but these scenarios are extremely rare and still risky. To climb in League, it's all about consistency. Taking the option that allows you to consistently perform well is a steady way to improve and win more games. When you want to be proactive in Rome, make sure to set them up for yourself. If you can set up your wave to push and crash your waves in before you roam, this will allow you to roam while losing almost nothing. There is an option where you drop a wave to roam, but this is an advanced technique that you can climb without ever using. Roaming is going to come at some cost, so you want to make sure you at least pay less every time you do. Sometimes you pull ahead and manage to snag Baron. Then you start barreling down mid. Everything's going well, until you get wiped and realize you just threw the game. This is called overstaying or overreaching. It doesn't even need to be with your team. You can make this mistake on an individual level too. One buzzword that's thrown out left and right is greedy. That's basically what this mistake is, being greedy. You need to know when it's time to hit the brakes and take a reset rather than trying to go for play after play. Remember that kill and turret leads don't make you stronger than your opponents, items do. If you get a lot of money off of making consecutive plays, you're not stronger until you actually spend that money and translate it into power advantages. Going for too many plays is one of the most common ways to throw a lead. It's okay, take a deep breath, you don't always have to end the game in 20 minutes. And if you do, that's probably a personal issue. The best way to tell if you're overstaying is to just ask yourself if you can win another fight. Take into consideration which teammates have their ultimates, how healthy you or your teammates are, and of course what the numbers are. 
Is it going to be a 5v5, a 5v3? For how long though? Once you start getting anxious or lose that certainty that you previously had, it's probably time to take your reset and set up for another play. It's time to talk about the chat. While many might associate it as being a toxic landmine, you're always in control of how you use it. A lot of players don't use the chat properly, which is pretty obvious with how often flame gets thrown around. This is a separate concept from whether you should mute all or play with the chat. Regardless of whether you read it or not, you can always use it. First off, you don't want a flame because it doesn't do anything for you and it just makes everyone play worse. You're going to tilt your teammates and you're also going to take the focus away from your main objective, winning the game. Remember that you can also give out feedback without attacking a player. Use general words like we and don't call out a specific person. If we peel our marksmen, we win fights. Dive the back line off of my engage. Statements like these communicate the necessary information without calling out a specific player and tilting them. It's not about being nice, it's about doing whatever increases your odds of winning. That's exactly what you want to use the chat for, communicating things that'll help you get objectives and ultimately win. Time summoner spells, relay information about which objectives you need to set up for, and communicate gank opportunities. You might know that you can dive the enemy top laner, but your jungler won't know that. It's really as simple as typing path top we can dive. But my teammates don't read chat, is what you might say, but remember that not every game is the same. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. It's about consistency, and you need to do everything you can, whenever you can. Next up, we want to talk a little bit about items. Healing is pretty much everywhere in the game. So many players don't understand the value of Grievous Wounds. Executioner's Calling is such a cheap way to access healing reduction. Unless your champion doesn't have AD scaling, you don't really have an excuse to not buy it. Bramble Vest and Morello Namicon are the alternatives that you also need to take into consideration. Let's just use 200 as a baseline for heals. Stuff like a Soraka heal or the Summoner spell fall into this category. You're able to mitigate 40% of this, effectively increasing your damage by 80. Against champions who have self-healing or against teams with several heals, the value increases even more. You still gain 15 damage from Executioner's Calling. That gold spent otherwise on AD would net you 20. In most situations, you'd rather take that healing reduction over 5 AD. With Morello Namicon, keep in mind that you're often trying to burst your opponents. Against teams that have an abundance of heals, healing reduction will do more than having some extra AP when you're trying to burst a target. Bramble Vest is another alternative that provides defensive stats. Off of that note, defensive stats have a lot of value. They're cheap, but still powerful. Each point of armor, or MR, increases your effective health versus that damage source by 1%. If you have 1,000 health and buy a cloth armor, that means you've gained 150 effective health for only 300 gold. Someone else who buys a longsword for 50 gold more would have to auto-attack you 15 times to match your purchase. That's a lot. To counter this, you need to build a Void Staff or Last Whisper item. There's a lot of cases where having penetration will yield you more damage than building more AD or AP. Pretty much any time an enemy has more than 100 MR, a Void Staff is probably the best purchase you can make. Around the 60 plus range, it's usually still the best one. It's going to depend specifically on your champion, of course, and you need to do some math. Against 50 MR, Void Staff increases your magic damage output by roughly 15%. Against 100, exactly 25%, and against 200, around 36%. Calculate your ratios and also how much MR the enemy team is building to make an educated guess over whether you should build a Void Staff or not. Armor is a much more common stat, and you should look to build either Dark Dominix Regards or Mortal Reminder anytime priority target on the team is stacking up on armor, or if several members are building it. To wrap it up, let's talk about minions. A lot of players are so focused on solo killing their opponent that they don't realize other ways to dominate their lane. You can build farm leads and also take turret plating. 20 minions is roughly a kill, while 2 plates gives you a little more than that. The only time you should value trading over farming is if it can give you control over the wave. This is the safest play because you set up potential solo kills while also having the option to force your enemy to overextend. Even if you trade heavily with your opponent, they can always play extremely passively and refuse to give you that solo kill you want. In these situations, you'll still come out even because you gave up too much farm in spite of the fact that it might have felt like you were crushing your opponent. If you're in a winning matchup and can't build CS leads, you're doing something wrong and it's probably with your wave management. You can create short freezes to deny your opponent, create CS leads, buy better items than them, and then take advantageous fights. When you get good trades, this should always transition into a farm lead, turret plate lead, or at least open up roam opportunities for you. Remember that one of the most important things you need to carry is gold. Whenever you pick up several solo kills and manage to 1v9, why is that? 
it's because you got a bunch of gold and EXP by killing your opponent and that transitioned into an item advantage. You can do the same thing without killing your opponent. Honestly, if you manage the wave well, especially at lower elo, you'll probably find three sources of income. Farm advantages, turret plate advantages, and solo kills when your enemies overextend. Alright, that concludes this video. Thanks so much for watching everyone, we really appreciate it. And if you guys want more content to help you improve, check out ProGuides.com where we've teamed up with pro players to create guides designed to take your game to the next level. Also, keep an eye on our YouTube channel where we're constantly updating it with new content just like this. If you guys want to hit me up on social, you can find me at, at Daniel Ammerman. And good luck out there in the Rift. We'll see you all next time.